Recording. Recording. All right, so today is June 1st, and we're continuing our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi, and we're joined once again, our second interview with Derek Jensen. Uh, Hugh, do you, wanna, do you have any questions that you want to start off, or do you want to continue from last week um, yeah, or let's... last time? Well, let's continue from last time. But but in the meantime, I wanted to ask about the reception that the book and the movie have got because we've had a little time since we last spoke to you. So, Derek, do you just want to let us know what's happened and how people are taking it? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Well, it, it has gotten um, essentially no mainstream reviews, which has been true for almost all my work. And uh, the individual reviews, you know, I, like everybody else, despise Amazon as having destroyed bookstores everywhere. But um, nonetheless, it's gotten a, a lot of uh, positive reviews from readers on Amazon. Um, and various individuals have written to me to, to say they like it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's selling okay for a... Uh, for a small publisher book, um, so it's it's doing fine. But the, the, part of the reason that I'm hesitating is because uh, the first thing I ever had published back in 1983 or something was an interview, and I I asked the the publisher of the magazine if they'd heard any responses, and they laughed and said. Um, there are two ways to not find out what people think about your writing. One is to not get published, and the other is to get published. And the point is that you you never hear a lot. You know, you'll get a few notes from people who really like it, and a few notes from people who really hate it. But I think, uh, yeah, but but that's about it. So I don't know. I think it's doing well, and and um, the people I care about like it. Yeah, I certainly liked it. It's it's very. Powerful. I mean, I'm, I'm completely in your camp and uh, a bit of a doomer, but I, it, it was, it, it depressed me <laughs> to, uh, reading it um, because it's so, I mean, I know a lot of the things already that you're saying, some things I didn't know, like, uh, like one of the things was wind farms actually create more local heating than they do cooling, um, which is, was a new one on me. But I, I, I'm known generally I've kind of tracked through the same path, um, I think, that is most of the material in the book. Uh, but presented all in one go like that, it's really an assault. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's really, it just highlights where we've got to and, and how deep the problem, the problem is. Um, yeah. But yeah, go ahead. I, I get that I get that response to my work a lot, and I've gotten it ever since the beginning. And um, I respect it, and there's a part of me that doesn't really understand it because, um, well, I guess I can understand it. Here's how I don't understand it, and then how I understand it. And the way I don't understand it is, you know, it's not really cognitively difficult. It's, you know, we all know that solar panels come from somewhere and that they're made out of something and that something was probably mined and the mines caused damage. And so for me, when I'm surrounded by a bunch of lies, it feels when I read something that's true, it's like, oh, this is such a gift. And I actually feel much better. So that's how I, I don't really understand the depressing part. The way I do understand the depressing part is, um, you know, I know how bad things are going in the oceans. I know how bad things are going in the rivers. I know how bad things are going for insects. But that doesn't alter the fact that when I read an account of exactly how bad they are, it is a slap in the face and it's like, yeah, that's, that's, I knew it was bad. I just didn't know it was this bad. And that is depressing. And then the other way I can really understand it is, you know, I, I don't know if I said last time that I really believe, I mean, yes, I know, especially when talking to, to sort of 
alternative types that we always have to put in the caveat about there are problems in the Western medical model. Yeah, I agree. So that caveat aside, I like, I like the model as a doctor friend of mine says that the, the proper diagnosis is the first step toward correct treatment. And that said, when a doctor came in to diagnose me, to tell me that I had Crohn's disease when I was 24, it depressed the hell out of me. You know, it's just like, yes, I want to know so that we can make our way forward, but I didn't want to know that. And so there's a sense in which I don't understand the, oh my gosh, your work is so depressing. And then there's a sense in which I do understand the people when people find it depressing. Yeah, but it seems to me it's a behavioral problem. So you've got to look at it more like an addiction, like alcoholism. Right. So it's not quite agree. the same as being diagnosed with Crohn's disease because that's really something that's out of your control. What makes it difficult is that we are all living a lie. I mean, to uh, everybody has to live a bit of a lie just to get through the day in our society. So we we all capable of being in denial of our alcoholism. And so it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's much more difficult for an alcoholic to admit that they have a chronic disease that they've caused themselves. And then it's very easy to say, no, I don't have a problem. I, <laughs> my liver will get better or whatever the, the diagnosis is. Um, so it's the culpability mm -hmm. that makes us, makes it difficult to, to stare in the face because you're really rubbing people's noses in it saying you know I'm the same as you that I like the truth but I've noticed that people don't like the truth and I, I don't find many people that like the truth people are all looking for ways to bolster their lives I completely agree with you and I really like that analysis you just made and one of the responses that I have gotten to the book that has uh, kind of annoyed me is I've gotten a few notes from people saying and they say this about all my books. Why don't you provide any solutions? And we have a chapter called Solutions. And the problem is we provide solutions. It's just they don't like them. And I don't mind the fact that they, uh, that they don't like the solutions, but I wish they would at least tell the truth about that and say, I didn't like your solutions, as opposed to saying we didn't even provide them. And where this ties into the alcoholic thing is... You can have a bunch of people provide solutions to the alcoholic, okay, like one of them might be stop drinking, and they're like, well, you're not providing me any solutions. So the truth is, and I just I wrote a note to a guy just a couple days ago who had sent me a note saying that we didn't provide any solutions, and even the solutions we did provide, he put them in scare quotes, calling them solutions. And... I said exactly what I just said to you, and I said the problem is that people don't like the solutions because the solutions prioritize life on the planet rather than the economic system. And that makes it, you know, it's worse than them just saying, just ignoring it. It's, you know, R.D. Lang came up with the three rules of a dysfunctional family. And rule A is don't which is, well, we'll get, go through all of them. Rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist, and rule A2 is never discussed the existence of rules A, A1, or A2. So in a family that's alcoholic, rule A is don't discuss the alcoholism. You can talk about anything else in the world except for that. And then rule A1 is there is no rule against talking about alcoholism. It's just you don't. Same with abuse, same with, with any of that. And then there's this other thing that's really interesting to me um, and stop me if I talked about this last time. I just love this. This guy in the 60s, Lester Laborski, did this experiment where he attached electrodes to people's eyeballs and he would track where they would look. And I mean, they did this on purpose. It wasn't like he attached to random people's eyeballs. Anyway, then he would show them a picture or an article or something. And what he found is that if it contained something the person found morally objectionable, their eyes would not even track to it once, which means they saw it in the corner of their eyes and they knew where not to look. And there's a great example I, I happened to read. At the same time I read about Lester Laborski in the early 2000s, there was an article I happened to see in the newspaper about some U.S. Uh, 
drug enforcement agency guy in Colombia whose wife was arrested for smuggling cocaine in the United States. And their story, which I believe, was that she had been doing lines of coke in front of him and he would walk through the room and not see it. And now if we think about this with our own lives, you know, I don't know if I'm the only person who's ever been in a really bad relationship, but in this relationship, if somebody said to me, hey, this is, uh, you know, there are problems in your relationship, I would respond, why are you trying to ruin my perfect relationship? And then after the thing's over, it's like, oh my God, how do they not see that? And so my point is that I think the people who complain that there are no solutions in, in my work aren't actually lying. I think that they are just simply not perceiving them. Or if they do perceive it at all, it's like, well, that's completely unrealistic. And the solutions, just for people who haven't read the book, are things like restoring prairies, restoring forests. Um, you know, a, a line that I've said for many years is um, when people ask, how can we save the salmon? That's not really what they're asking. What they're asking is, how can we save the salmon without stopping industrial logging, without stopping industrial fishing, without taking out dams, without stopping the murder of the oceans, and without stopping global warming? And the answer is you can't. And it's the same here. I want to say two more things. It's the same here with global warming, that how can we stop global warming without fundamentally altering our relationship with the planet? And you can't. How can we stop global warming yet continue to have this blowout party? And then one of the things I didn't say to the, to the guy in the note the other day, but I was thinking about, and I thought about this a lot, is imagine you have one person in a neighborhood or one family in a neighborhood who makes their living by stealing from everybody else in the neighborhood. And at some point, everybody else in the neighborhood gets sick of this. And they say to the person, stop stealing from us. And the person's like, how am I going to buy a new car if I'm not taking from you? That's not a realistic solution. And it's the same. You know, we're doing, we've been committing, perpetrating, whatever words you want, or in, whatever words you want to use, drawdown for a long time. And the entire wave of life is based on drawdown. So any solution that stops drawdown will not be acceptable. To, to most people because they're addicted, exactly what you said. Yeah, people want the methadone. They don't want to kick the habit. They, they want some something other than going cold turkey that you know, as a substitute for that, that really keeps the habit going. But yeah, um, the, I think the thing is it just depends on how far gone you think the situation is. Because at some stage, I think everybody's at, on some kind of spectrum of realizing how bad the ecological situation on the planet is. And if you're kind of depressed, then you, you can see it a lot easier. Uh, if you, you know, just got promoted in your job and you're making lots of money and you just bought a yacht, it's really, really difficult for you to, to believe that the planet's in trouble because you're not. And so... I think that uh, people, you know, the, uh, the bright greens have certainly got to the stage where they've, they've, they know exactly what the problem is. They have, you know, willful blindness because the, to the thought of actually giving up on electricity and civilization is just too much. Just, just the thought of saying that the whole civilization project, civilization itself is not viable. And it it basically runs at a deficit. So everybody thinks that there's a, a, you know, a surplus or some kind of dividend that comes from tech. And nobody, you know, I think uh, you and Leah and uh, Max are some of the few people that <laughs> agree with me that there is no, no um, profit out of civilization. It actually runs at a deficit. But that's such a huge thought to people that they've been living since, you know, 10,000 years uh, just in this fiction. But it, to overthrow that, you have to overthrow every great mind in the Western tradition. You have to overthrow science. You have to, you know, there's so much you have to throw out that you can see that I think a lot of people would rather die than, than go there. 
Well, yes, I, I completely agree. And especially they would rather kill the planet than go there. And that's one of the things that I, I, I got from Lundy Bancroft's work about uh, domestic violence perpetrators is that, you know, the cliche is that addicts don't change until they hit bottom. And the problem with those who are addicted to their own entitlement at the cost of others is that they're not the ones who hit bottom. Everybody else does. They're doing fine, thank you very much. And so the, the problem is that insects are hitting bottom and that uh, freshwater mussels are hitting bottom and that anadromous fish are hitting bottom and uh, poor humans are hitting bottom, but the rich humans, it's like we are, we are literally living better than kings 500 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, you know, Roman emperors, I don't know if they had access to ice cream 24-7. They may have had access to iced goods 24-7, um, but they didn't have instantaneous communication. They didn't have rapid travel. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm sure you've read William Catton's Overshoot. I don't remember the number of ghost slaves that we have. That he talks about ghost slaves are, are the amount of energy that we use if we're provided by human slaves. And I don't know what the number is. I'm making this up, so don't quote the number. But it's like each one of us has access to 490 slaves worth of yeah, energy. I, th I thought it was about 600. Yeah. For for oh, for American, yeah. overestimate than overestimate. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so we have access to six hundred. Why would we want to give this up? And of course, Mumford talked about this as the magnificent bribe. That his question was, why have we all surrendered so easily to the system? And he said that the the advantage of this system over the more, as he called them, half baked autocratic systems of the past, is that this one has. Uh, made the promise of extending the goodies to at least a significant minority of the people. And this is one of the things that horrifies me is that we are trading the world for access to ice cream 24-7 and, and to television programs and to, you know, whatever else. And admittedly, to modern medicine and to to you know, the, the things that actually do make our lives better, as well as just luxuries that literally no one could have dreamed of a while ago. And it kills me too. There's this great, I love the, I'm going to butcher it, but there was a title of a, a Doobie Brothers album uh, that is Once Were What Habit, Once, What Were Once Vices Are Now Habits. And it's extraordinary how things that were complete luxuries, I and mean, we don't, we, I think I mentioned this last time that uh, there was a study done uh, in the UK of people 18 to 25 or something like that. And given a choice between Wi-Fi and sunlight, they chose Wi-Fi. And, you know, you and I grew up without Wi-Fi and we grew up without computers. Um, and it's... Uh, it's extraordinary how fast, you know, my mom was born before telephones were a big deal. They existed, but most people didn't have them. And if they did, it was party lines. And, um, you know, go back one more generation. Uh, so my mom's mom, my grandma, was probably born in like 1900 something. And I'm guessing they didn't have electricity when she was born. It's, this is all just the, the briefest blip. And we presume that we can't live without it. I'm sorry. Humans lived without it for a long, long time. Yeah, my, my grand was born in 1900. And so, yeah, she, she didn't have electricity because she, it was on a farm. So it was, you know, and most people had oil lamps and things like that. It's... Uh, it, technology has taken off tremendously in the last decades. I mean, in terms of, I can remember um, my stepfather helped him build his yacht and um, sail his yacht. But in those days, 
nobody had all the electronics that are on a yacht today. And this is just the 80s. So, so you know, you had an oil heater and you had oil lamps and stuff like that and, and gas. And now boats are just filled with with gadgets and electronics. It's just unbelievable. If anything goes wrong, you need you know, a computer technician to to um, to to fix them. But there, there's a, a growing community of, of sailors that have tried to go retrograde and try to, you know, get things that you can manufacture yourself. So you, you've got to put more wood in and you've got to, you know, learn traditional um, skills like celestial navigation and things that are dying out. And, and so there's kind of grassroots movement <laughs> kind of prepping. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to get more in line with those guys. They're getting more minimalist. And so you, need, you need very little uh, to survive on a boat. In fact, on land too, but, but it's noticeable on a boat. Um, so I'm trying to move in, in that, that direction. But yeah, it's, I, I also live with uh, solar and all my water is made with a water maker from solar. And uh, so um, I, I had a wind generator, which I, I chucked away. I gave it away because it was useless. And so I know firsthand that we cannot run our civilization on solar, just the, the expense of the batteries and how, you know, what you can actually do with batteries. You switch on a microwave oven, you cook the batteries in seconds. And nobody seems to realize that. They think we're all going to have batteries and uh, and then, you know, it's, it, it, it's not going to be like they think it is. It's going to be like you say, where they're doing massive, you know, dam building programs to, you know, have hydro powered storage, and so, so there's a there's a big con game going on within the con game of the bright green lies as well, right? Yeah, I agree with that, and that was that was one of the things I love about being a writer is that I go into a book with some ideas, but I learn as much as readers learn through it, and. I didn't know, for example, that like whatever it is, 95%, when they talk about grid, grid level storage, they, you know, we hear a lot about lithium batteries, which are atrocities in themselves, but 95% of it is that pumped hydro storage or 96 or 97, 93, somewhere in there. And I had no idea about that. In fact, when we wrote the book, it was 99%. It's just gone down a little bit in the last couple of years. And Pumped hydro storage is simply you make two big dams and you one of them's higher than the other and you pump water up when you've got excess electricity, like when excuse me, when the wind's blowing and the sun's shining. And then when you need the electricity, you let it run back down. And I'm pretty horrified by the fact that we even have to discuss uh, the ecological harm caused by dams. And there are a lot of pumped hydro storage, in other words, big dams, that are basically shovel ready, waiting for funding all over the world. And it's, you know, there was a line by um, Ozzy Zenner that I just love, which has to do with electric cars, which is generally environmentalists don't like electronics and generally they don't like cars, but if you put, them together and make an electric car, suddenly environmentalists are jumping up and down and saying, this is great. And it's the same with this, that one of the things that has happened in my activist life, so in the past 30, 35 years, is that environmentalism has been so captured by the bright greens that dams used to be something to be unreservedly opposed. And now you you actually have some environmental organizations that are in favor of dams because they've been captured so completely by this notion that we have to continue to power civilization. And another lie that just I didn't know going in, but it's just but it just kills me is it's the whole Jevons paradox stuff that basically every time you bring a new energy source on, you don't replace old ones, you just add on. So it became really clear to me early in the book that all of this stuff about um, we need to, to make 
all of this to stop global warming. I mean, it's not working at all. We can cover that more, but it's really a response more than anything to a the insatiable demands, uh, the insatiable energy demands of this culture, and b the fact that oil is finite, and so they need to get. Uh, okay, I I really, I I I I. My character is not to reach toward conspiracy theories, but instead toward historical forces. You know, sort of larger historical. It's not. It's not a cabal of six people who are deciding something. Instead, it's sort of the functionings of capitalism or the functionings of societies. Um, the point is that it is a sociological response to the fact that we cannot question the insatiable energy demands and this recognition that uh, oil is finite and there need to be more sources brought on and these sources are incredibly expensive and then combine that with Naomi Klein's brilliant understanding that, uh, you know, the, her shock doctrine stuff about the way you get peoples to hand over tremendous amounts of money is by scaring them. And capitalism itself has used global warming, which is legitimately scary, it's terrifying, they've used that instead of actually to, to face the problem, they've used that to get trillions in subsidies for the additional energy sources. And again, this is not some sort of secret conspiracy. This is just how the system works. Am, am I, is what I'm saying making any sense? Yeah, I have a um, multi-million dollar friend, maybe a billionaire, and he's really far right. I mean, he openly says he's a fascist. And um, uh, and generally, I found this with conservatives on the far right, is that they say, well, the whole of uh, global, uh, climate crisis and things like that is just a huge scheme by the left to wring money out of the government for all these schemes. And he's absolutely right. They, they, I mean, Biden's going to spend 1.9 trillion on a version of the Green New Deal, but it's it's just an an economic stimulus package and giant industrialization program to compete with China. So he's absolutely right. But where the where they get get it wrong is they assume that means that climate change is a hoax. Exactly. Saying, no, climate change is real. And they are abusing it for for capitalists and industrial uh, projects. So they they are he, you know the the right doesn't get that that it's possible that the climate you know the, the environment is collapsing at the same time as these guys are trying to in, you know build the economy. Yeah, I completely agree with with everything you said, and also just for the record, it's I find it. There's a sense in which I find it easier to deal with the people who are open fascists than the people who are sort of lefties who pretend to like the environment but then do great harm to it. Um, and it, there's, I, I say that as somebody who has lived my adult life, in fact, almost all my life in the rural West of the United States which has some very strong anti-environmental groups and very strong anti-environmental sentiments. And that can be really frustrating, but at the same time, there is something uh, refreshing about sort of having somebody openly oppose you as opposed to taking some of your rhetoric and then turning it around for ends that aren't actually, that are actually in opposition to you. Well, talking about that, I think it's a good time to broach the subject of um, your AMA on the Collapse subreddit. So I don't know if you saw the, the upshot of it, but in you've been kind of, all three of you have been disinvited from Collapse. They made huge apologies and they said they 
gonna, you know, the 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 moderators said that they are gonna announce in advance who they get on an AMA so that they don't offend people. And uh, of course, your big offense is, you know, is your perceived transphobia. And they also, I think, a lot of people pegged Leah as um, as a turf. And so I, I got the strong impression from it. I, I, well, I, first of all, I don't know if you're familiar with the background to Collapse, and if you've, if you, uh, the Collapse subreddit, and if you if you know what they they're about. But I, I think they are. It's difficult to tell their gender, but I think they are actually bright greens. And so I I put a number of posts um, to Bright Green Lies and to Julia Barnes's movie, and they took it down. And then a lot of people protested, and then they kind of weaseled out and they kind of put it back up. But they, they tried to suppress <laughs> the book and the movie on the Collapse subreddit. And then when, when I saw that AMA and saw the, the upshot of it, I thought that it was a hit job. I thought it was a deliberate hit job, just like they did to Roger Hallam. So Desite uh, did something very similar in Germany. They kind of completely trashed Roger Hallam and got him kicked out of XR. And they did it by just reference, making a reference to the Holocaust. It was just completely out of context. And then they used that as uh, a, as a means to just bring him down. And I, I got the strong sense that that's what they did to you. I think that there were, you know, you got to be conspiracy, uh, conspiratorial about this because I don't know at what level this conspiracy comes in. But it seemed to be an, a, a direct hit on you guys, on just, you know, wokest, uh, wokest agenda. But what you have said, did you know about any of this in the aftermath of the AMA? No, I don't. I've I've never uh, been on Reddit. I mean, except for that, and I don't. I've gotten a few notes afterwards from people who were on there, basically apologizing for the for 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 what happened, and um, it uh, the whole thing was handled incredibly poorly. It. Uh, so for those who, who don't know anything about it, we were asked to ask me anything. We were asked on there, and they said, we will keep everything polite. And then they did, first off, a terrible moderation because they were allowing in all sorts of insulting stuff. And, and it was asked me anything. So I took them at face value, and I responded to the insulting things seriously. I did not... I pretended I was too stupid to understand they were insulting and then just answered the, the content. And, um, and then they took down my response to some of the stuff as being offensive when, uh, and left up the insults, the original insults. And that's when I quit. I just said, sorry, I'm not going to participate anymore. This is, this is crap. And um, and then what I did is I went public with what happened, which is what I'm going to do every time this happens. And I've done this for a while now, that, that when I get deplatformed over these issues, I just go public with it. And it ends up being great because I end up getting a lot more attention to all the issues than I would have just from the original thing. And there's a, there's a couple a couple issues. And I don't know, we can we can either go the the whole trans issue, if you want or not, it doesn't matter. But the, the, the yeah, I would like to go with it. But uh, but I'd like to know first if um, if you think it was a deliberate hit because you know here here you've got this great book. It's so emotional and so much passion in it from you and and the other co-authors. And it got completely trashed. And I, I thought it's it's deliberate. It was a setup. I, I got the strong feeling that you were set up. To, to detract from the message of bright green lights because they are bright greens on our collapse they just hide it well that's that's that i i don't i i will defer to you because i don't know like i've never been there before i just showed up to answer the questions and it seems odd to me again i'm not disagreeing with you but it, it seems odd to me that you would have a collapse forum that would be bright green because 
collapse is really talking about collapse, it's not talking, it would seem to me that if I was going to make a collapse group, it would be, I mean, if, if any direction it went, it would be, what's it going to look like? It wouldn't be, let's build solar panels to actually make the ultimate crash worse. I mean, that, that just seems, that seems silly to me. It's not so much the kind of what I call neon green, so it's kind of solar panels and, and wind farms. It's it's more like the communist thing, so the Gramsci's long march through the institutions. And so it's kind of celebrating the collapse of capitalism and the capitalist way. And the idea is that, you know, oh, China's brilliant and China's green, and so, you know, we will all be Chinese, and so it'll be um, a Chinese utopia now that China's, uh, you know, world hegemon. So I, I th there are a lot of uh, communists and stuff on on our collapse from what I can see. If you if you track the users, they make kind of really obvious um, kind of comments. You can well, first, look at their history and you can see where they're coming from. Well, first, it's nonsense to say that China's communist. I mean, for crying out loud, it's just another form of capitalism. It's it's a different form of state-sponsored capitalism. It's just that's not I'm not agreeing with you. That's that no, for now. For, for, for now, for, for now. I, but I, I always harbored a suspicion that they never gave up communism. They're just using state capitalism so that they can, you know, take over the world, <laughs> and then they will uh, implement communism. Well, well, I don't, I don't actually think that that that's possible on an industrial scale in any case because. Industrialism requires that industrial production requires that re resources be funneled toward the producers, and so you're always going to end up with, and what is either a managerial or an ownership class. Yeah, yeah but the, you see, um, okay, now we have to get conspiratorial because we kind of got you. You know about Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it it's uh, from. What I can tell is Klaus Schwab is also communist, and they are industrialists. They're thinking they're transhumanists, and they're thinking everything will be managed by AI. So they all kind of converge because you had a capitalist like Gates who thinks the same way. They all think that we're going to have this <coughs> kind of managed utopia that's going to be managed uh, by technocrats who will look after us in a paternalistic way. And every all the problems will be solved by AI and uh, and tech. So so every problem you come up with in in bright green lies will be solved by tech according to them. And and so that's why I mentioned last time that I really feel you should get onto your next book and hopefully it'll be something against geoengineering because what's increasingly becoming obvious is they're going to do geoengineering to buy more time. And and so I think it'll be an unmitigated disaster in the yeah. long run. But you can see how they all converge. Is they, none of them are. We've capitalism has ended. It's everybody's a state capitalist now, and they're heading towards communism. Especially, you know, Klaus Schwab says, "You will own nothing, and you will be happy," which is a long-standing, you know, utopian transhumanist and communist thing. So I completely agree with you on the transhumanism. I agree with all of your analysis. I think, and not that this matters, but I think the only thing I would disagree with is, I don't know that I would call that communism. I don't, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, we are having, the only disagreement here is purely linguistic in what you call it, uh, because I completely agree with every bit of that analysis. And, and the, it, it's it and it all is right in line with um, uh, uh, Lewis Mumford's understanding that the technics, the the combo of technology and society, end up uh, becoming authoritarian and end up running running. I mean that we end up serving the machines and serving the social machines as well, and it doesn't really matter. That, Kirkpatrick Sale, we quote Kirkpatrick Sale in. Bright Green Lies about how these technologies are incredibly adaptable. It's sort of technocratic state. I don't remember what he calls it, but I think that might be it. The technocratic state is incredibly adaptable and it can go, it can be adapted to um, 
a quote benign dictatorship like Singapore or an outright dictatorship like Saudi Arabia. It can be adapted to liberal Norway or conservative, you know, name some other country. And all these others are, all these other parts are, all these other economic and governing systems are really secondary to the technocratic control of society. And I think we yeah, probably I mean, agree on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, Marx was always an industrialist and he yeah. always believed in the surplus, even though, you know, if you go back to ancient civilizations, and there was no surplus. They all ran at a deficit. That's why they're all ruins today. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, uh, Marx was fundamentally an industrialist. So it's, all of these agree. There's, there's, only, there's only the Greens and the anarchists that, that are, oppose um, this industrial controlled society. But right. I don't think there's a benevolent form of it because it's all extractive and, and it all just pushes us further into drawdown. Completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. So there's one thing I want to go back to. We can go back to multiple things too, but I want to go back to one thing with your discussion of the, the collapse AMA that is one of the things that is destroying discourse and is, I think, frankly, horrific. And it's coming from the left. I don't know if the right does it or not. That is the cooties theory of politics, which is... If anybody has any impure thought, if anybody disagrees with dogma at any point, then that person is not allowed to speak on any issues whatsoever. And there are there's this whole list of, of hot button topics about which if you disagree, it kills me. Anarchists are supposed to be no gods, no masters, but honestly, a lot of anarchists hate me because I don't run everything I say past the Anarchist Central Committee before putting it out there. Or you could, you could also say I don't get approval of the Anarchist Bishop Synod. And there's a whole bunch of these. Like I interviewed this person earlier this year, uh, Diana Johnstone. The interview I did with her, she's an old school lefty from, you know, she's in her late 80s now. And the question I asked her was, why is, how has belonging to the EU become a, the, the, the left used to be against globalization, but now if you are, for example, in favor of Brexit, you are a fascist. And I don't actually have a huge opinion on Brexit. I'm not, I don't live there. All I know is most of my sort of lefty friends, if I, if I even ask, why, what's wrong with Brexit? They get really mad and call me a Nazi. And again, I'm not taking a position on that issue. And I hate the fact I even have to put that stupid disclaimer in. Um, but that's one of them. Uh, there's a whole long list of issues that if you have any, if you blaspheme on those issues, you now have cooties and anybody who talks to you has cooties and then they all get infected and so we can't talk to anyone, even for one minute, who disagrees on those issues. And this I find completely horrifying. You know, I don't even agree with myself on every issue. There's plenty of things I've written in books that I don't agree with anymore. And this, uh, this sort of rigid, I'm, I'm sure you and I don't agree on every issue. And I don't care. I couldn't give a shit. And so it's it's that that I don't mind if okay. My and we can talk more about this or not if you want. But but my no, fundamental. No, I would like to talk about this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My fundamental uh, belief on the whole trans issue is that humans are a sexually dimorphic species, and a little boy who likes to play with dolls and wear dresses should be loved precisely for who he is, which is a little boy who loves to play with dolls and wear dresses. And a little girl who likes to play football and work on cars should be loved precisely for who she is, which is a little girl who loves to work on cars and play football. And your 
clothes choices and your hobby choices don't override physical reality. And also, women should not be forced to share their most vulnerable spaces with males, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all I said that they found was so offensive. And, and my, my real point is that I would have no problem if I was asked to do an ask me anything on a forum about the trans issue and then they got mad because I disagreed with them and kicked me off. But a collapse, I mean, it has nothing to do with the issue. So I would have no problem with Ed Ab with, with women getting mad at Ad Abby if he's talking about issues of how women are treated in literature because he didn't treat them well in literature. But if you're going to talk about environmental stuff, it's like Ed Abby's Ed Abby. And I don't, you know, I got interviewed a few months ago and a bunch of lefties got really mad at me for this. A guy asked me for an interview and I said yes, because I usually do. And, um, and then he said, right before the interview, he said, you know, you should know that I'm a, a I don't know if it was a white separatist or something. And like, we did the interview anyway. And it was, his questions were actually really good. And, um, and when I disagreed with him, I would disagree with him. Like one of his questions was, global warming is going to cause great migrations of people. So how will that affect, what do you think about that in terms of human migration? And he, he put in racial overtones on the question. I don't remember what they were. And I said, look, I'm going to say something's going to piss off the left and say something's piss off the right. The thing that's going to piss off the right is uh, the reason a lot of these people are, are moving, the reason a lot of people move into these other countries is not because they don't like their lives. It's because capitalism has destroyed their land base. And the people from Guatemala who come to the United States or from Mexico and become the United States, it's not because they want to take an eco tour of the San Joaquin Valley. It's because their land has been taken so we can have coffee and bananas. And so they're moving. It's capitalism's fault at the center of empire. And then the thing that's going to piss off lefties is I totally understand that if somebody's in a neighborhood and some new people come in, nobody likes that, no matter what race they are, no matter where they're from. I mean, that's this happens with bears. Some new bear comes in the neighborhood and everybody gets pissed at them. And if you have a community of a thousand people and all of a sudden you have a thousand new people come in, it doesn't matter if they're from New York City or from Guatemala, you're not going to like it unless you're a developer, in which case you're an asshole. And, um, and a lot of people got really mad at me because I simply talked to the guy. My, question, my answers were, were perfectly fine. Nobody had a problem with them. But, oh my God, you talked to this guy. I got lots of hate letters from people saying, I can't believe that you talked to this guy. It's like, whatever happened to talking to people we disagree with? I know this guy, Paul Sinfuegos, really great activist. He's been a wonder, he's one of my heroes before I was even an activist. He's so fabulous. And he's been declared persona non grata in Portland in many ways, where, he's, where he lives, because part of his work has involved going up to right-wingers and saying, give me your perspective. Just tell me, I want to understand your perspective um, so that we can see where we agree and disagree. And because he doesn't yell at them and tell them they're scum, then, then he has become persona non grata. And that's just, that's just insane. I mean, I've talked to loggers. I've had great conversations with loggers. And I've had great conversations. And we completely disagree on a lot of issues. But there's a, a, I won't tell this whole story because it's too long, but a, a short part of the story is I met this logger one time in completely non non environmental circumstances, and he he my car had a flat tire and he gave me a tire, and so then I go I go take him a cake to thank him for letting me use a tire to get home, and he says what do you do, and I realize he's a logger he's got like chainsaws all over his wall, and 
oh no no actually he'd asked me if i wanted some more firewood so he's standing out in back holding a chainsaw as he says what do you do and i say well i'm a writer he says what do you write about i'm like oh man and i finally i told him the truth because i'm not a very good liar and i said well right now i'm working on a book about how the big four timber companies got their land illegally from the public domain and he starts swearing and turns red in the face and i'm looking for a break in the fence and it takes me about 20 seconds to realize that he's an independent logger who was put out of business by Weyerhaeuser. And he hates the company even more than I do, which I didn't think was possible. <coughs> Excuse me. So in another 20 seconds, we got our arms around each other's shoulders, swapping atrocity stories of how much we hate Plum Creek, all these timber companies. And then we agree that we're gonna work together to take them down. And then I say to him, by the way, um, I'm against all forms of industrial logging. So after we take out Plum Creek, Potlatch, Boise, Cascade, and Weyerhaeuser, I'm coming after you. And then we both just laughed our asses off because we both recognize that that's not going to happen in our lifetimes because our difference is really theoretical. And it's the same. You find, this is what politics is. You find people that you can agree with. Oh, another funny story. I was doing an, I was asked to do an interview. I, I, I'm, Publishers have sometimes set up interviews, and one time a publisher set up an interview that I don't know what they were thinking because it ended up being the Pittsburgh Pirates post-game show. It's a baseball post-game show, and I like baseball, but I had no idea going in. I just you know, I called the number at the right time and, and then was put on, and both he and I are professionals, so it's like I didn't know what to say about the game, and he didn't know what to say about my book, but we, we needed to fill 15 minutes. So we started, we, we quickly, Western Pennsylvania, there's a lot of hunting. So what we both started talking about really quickly was how animal rights activists and hunters should work together to protect habitat. And then once the habitat's protected, the animal rights people can sabotage the hunts. And so I'm a big believer in making temporary alliances with whomever you have a temporary agreement with. And who cares what they think about other issues? And and then when you, but, the, but you're honest with them. So you say, look, we disagree on this and this and this, and I will never agree with you on those issues. But we happen to agree. Oh, a great example is my sister. And then I'll stop rambling about this. My sister's, one of my sisters really right wing. And she was a city councilor on a small town in Virginia. And she and I would disagree on a lot of issues, but she was one of those honest to goodness conservatives who believes in local control. So she voted against a shopping mall coming into her community. I would have voted against it because I hate shopping malls. She voted against it because it was going to be put in by somebody from Washington DC. And so it was a, a distant person controlling their local economy, which annoyed the hell out of her. So, if I would have been local, I would have really supported her on that issue. Okay, so now I'm, I'm done rambling. You can ask whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you on all of that. And uh, so, certainly on the trans stuff, I agree as well. Because it's we've been fragmented by identity politics, and everybody just grabs an identity and then defends it. And so... Uh, and then you get these groups, so LGBTQ, and then they, they kind of a block. And then uh, if you're an environmentalist, then you get the label eco-fascist. If, you, if you're not a bright green and you think that you know, electric vehicles and uh, solar panels, wind farms and stuff are going to harm the planet, well, then you're an eco-fascist. So there, there are all these scare words and labels, but I think exactly like you is that, like, you know, forget all the labels and identities and just say, you know, you, we're all human and we have proclivities and you... We have sexual preferences, and it doesn't matter. It's just something you do. It's not something you are. But they've done a very good job, and I blame, like, Eddie Bernays and these guys that actually deliberately set this up, uh, was to create identities so that basically we could be fragmented. I'm, I'm pretty so down I'm, on that conspiracy theory because... I'm, I'm rolling my <laughs> eyes because, because, because of exactly that, that I... Again, I have this sort of response against conspiracy theories, but the whole identity politics thing is so stupid and so 
uh, destructive that I start to veer into the conspiracy theory stuff. That it's like it was built up to destroy class consciousness. It, it exactly. was. It was. Yeah. Well, well yeah, go ahead, Tibi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, was, I just said exactly. Yeah, the Eddie Bernays uh, um, doing the um, perception management and giving us a consumer identity. Yeah, absolutely. And then yeah. what's going on yeah. with identity politics is everyone's going off in the silos and ossifying these identities and then knuckling down to defend them. And then it doesn't matter what kind of truth you throw at them. So it's really unhealthy. But the thing is that people need to realize is you, it is healthy to talk to people that have a different opinion to, than you because you'll never grow if you don't. And then you come away from that and you self-reflect and you, you eventually um, detox from the bad ideas that you had or the untruths that you learned from all of this. Yeah. So it's so, just healthy. Thank you for that. And the a line I used to say quite a bit, which is true, is that I don't have any close friends with whom I have to revisit civilization is bad 101 every time I open my mouth. And that's true. I don't have any close friends. Um, my closest friends aren't like that. But I talk to people otherwise. Like every Friday I work with, every Thursday, excuse me, I work with a guy who, who uh, back when the Tea Party was a big deal, he was a member of the Tea Party. And, um, and years ago, when I was getting a whole bunch of death threats, I put up bars on my windows. And um, the person who helped me put up the bars on the windows was this guy, because because he's a local friend. And you know, he's it doesn't matter to me that he's Tea Party. So that's one thing. And the other thing that's pretty interesting is that probably about half of my books or half of the content of every book has come because I've talked with somebody I disagreed with and they they said no civilization can be sustainable it can be made sustainable with with such and such and such and then I disagree with them in the moment but I don't have answers to their specific the specific issues they raise and so I go obsess about this or I go ruminate on it for six months and I start to come up with answers and that's how the entire book develops I mean, the whole Bright Green Lies book developed because I was in a debate with a Bright Green. And so I think it's incredibly useful to talk to the people you disagree with and to have them challenge you and say, that is not true. Uh, civilization is not going to collapse. And so I have to prove it yet again. And I think that that's incredibly helpful. Yeah, so we've been talking to... Uh guys on the libertarian right and and one guy in particular um <clears throat> who's you know rapidly getting famous now because of the um wuhan lab uh, thing um so he's a member of the team that that exposed that and the reason why Rand paul and all this stuff um has been going on is because of this team so he's he's rapidly getting not notorious actually famous but the, the guys on the far right are very interesting because you we can agree on stuff and amazing amounts of stuff, but then it gets weird very quickly. So for, I'll give you an example is that they climate denies. And so we come up with arguments about, you know, basic mainstream climate science. And the weird thing is that they also think we're all doomed. But from solar flares not from, not, not from climate science. so so it gets to be pretty interesting because you say well why are you worried about the climate because you know you might as well worry about asteroids or solar flares which are going to come because of biblical prophecy that's why it's going to come and you say well it's anthropogenic we can do something about climate change potentially um, just as human beings, I mean, as individuals, no. But, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's very, I, I totally agree with you that we should make uh, alliances of convenience because they also against the, you know, Green New Deal and all these massive industrialization programs, they also believe in homesteading and prepping and stuff. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, 
there's so many things that are congruent, but for for the wrong reasons. They <laughs> they have the same agenda in mind, and certainly you know kind of revolutionary. Um, and but these are the kind of hard hard right guys that are kind of did the insurrection right in January the sixth. So, um, but you just look at the insurrection, and you say, yeah, that's the right way to go. <laughs> it's like, I was very disappointed. I might <laughs> tell you about the, your, the solutions that you had and the thing. A lot of them said, you know, the government must do stuff. <laughs> so like, the government's the last thing that's going to do something about it. I think we, we really need to destroy all this decentralization before they start doing mammoth geoengineering projects and stuff. And the libertarians, they, they think exactly the same reason they think the same thing for different reasons. When I used to teach at uh, Eastern Washington University in the 90s, I had one student one time who was <clears throat> a far right winger, um, and we used to have really interesting discussions. And basically where we came to is that um, he said, look, both you and I hate corporations and the government. And you, Derek, um, want to go after the corporations first and the government second. I, whatever his name was, want to go after the government first and the corporations second. And that's our main difference. And you know, I don't know that I completely agree with that, but I don't know that I completely disagree with it either. I think it was, it was an interesting, and we both agreed that they're both autocratic. We both agreed that Neither one serves human beings or communities. Or another guy, pretty interesting. This guy was, it was the same guy actually. Was he was a former law, uh, former sawmill owner who'd been put out of business by Warehouser, and um, he and I would get into big disagreements about logging. And one place we came to an agreement is we agreed, and this relates back to the thing with my sister. We agreed that no one should be allowed to clear cut more than let's say a half a mile or a quarter mile from their home and their water source. So somebody who lives in Canada cannot deforest in Washington. Somebody who lives in Washington can't deforest in the Amazon. And I don't think you should be able to deforest anywhere, but, and this is a start. We both agreed on absentee ownership is an absolute disaster. Well, well, can I present this idea to you? So I think the way things are coming down more and more, I mean, the, the way it was up until fairly recently was climate deniers against, you know, climate catastrophists and climate alarmists, what they call them. But I think that the battle lines have changed. I saw in that rich friend that I mentioned, he used to be a rampant climate denier. And uh, in the last couple of years, he stopped climate denial. Now he he's he's kind of uh, he doesn't talk about it anymore. <laughs> he used to campaign against it, um, and it's clear that that everybody's a little bit scared because there've been one or two headlines that have been a bit scary, and so so they will admit that this uh, you know cli what I'm trying to say is climate denial is kind of passe. And where the new battle lines, I think, are drawing is, is this idea of the transhumanists, the centralized control, and essentially the eugenesis. There's no other word for it. Um, and just this technical, nerdy, you know, the singularity of the nerds, the rapture of the nerds and stuff is what they think is going to happen. And that's one side. And then the other side, which cuts right down the middle of the old divide, uh, is people like us that are for the living planet and for living organisms and against industrialization and this this kind of macabre obsession with killing things off and making a market out of them. And so it's kind of like I would call like team human against the transhumanists. And the, you know, if you if you look at Naomi Klein and stuff saying that the polar bear doesn't do it for her, she, she's on the wrong side of the bench. She's a transhumanist. And she, she wants technical solutions and this kind of uh, One Health, you know, this huge initiative uh, really from the United Nations and things like that, and WAF and all, all these NGOs and really kind of 
easy to be conspiratorial guys. Uh, you be conspiratorial about these guys. But these billionaires, the green billionaires like Gates, um, Musk even a little bit. Um, but, you know, Klaus Schwab and that, they, they, their idea of environmentalism is, it's kind of a, you've got to imagine it as kind of a park and it's kind of reserved, it's managed. Ecology is definitely a managed thing. And then there's, I see the our team as being, you know, you've got to get the management out of things. You've got to stop this narrative of control and management and supervision of nature and just accept that we're subordinate to nature. And so I think that that's the new divide. What do you think about that idea? I like it. I, I agree with it. I, I like it a lot. And the, 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 the hesitation in my voice is not with the idea. The hesitation in the voice is that I think you are more articulate about it than probably many of the people who are on the other side of the fence. I, I, I know that there is the extreme transhumanist who claim that. I would guess that Naomi Klein would disagree with you that she's a transhumanist. Um, but, but she's an industrialist, right? She's an engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. De, de facto, she is on the side of engineering and management and, and, and honestly colonialism because you have to be. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that killed me about this changes everything is that she talked about how she talked about being strongly anti-colonialist, but you can't make solar panels in your backyard. I mean, they are a product of empire. And she's really excited because the price of solar panels has gone down so much. And the reason it's gone down so much is because they all moved from Germany to China. And in China, they use slave labor and um, they dump the stuff out in the open. They dump the, the pollution out in the open. And that's why the price has gone down, or major reason the price has gone down. And so, yes, I, I agree with you. And the, 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 the difficulty comes that it is up to people like you and me to articulate this because I think many of the people on the industrialist side well I think they I think you're right they would recognize that they are pro industry and they would say that they are that's part of the problem is that this culture has been able to make it so people can more easily envision the end of life on the planet than they can the end of this culture and when you say I want this culture to end. A criticism I get all the time is, oh, you want life to end. It's like, no, actually, I want life to continue. And they'll say, you want humans to all die. It's like, no, the way we're going is going to be much worse than, I mean, if we continue, every day, drawdown is making it so the carrying capacity for humans, even if you don't care about anybody else, Every day, drawdown is making it so the carrying capacity of this planet for humans is lower than it was the day before. And so if you care, I mean, I write. I write for non-humans. I write for prairie dogs and salmon. But I also write for the humans who will be here in 100 years, if anybody's here in 100 years. Um, and I think, I don't think, I, I know in my bones that humans 100 and 150 years from now will vastly prefer your and my perspective than they will the bright green perspective because our perspective at least gives the slightest chance of a livable planet i don't give it a really good chance but it gives the slightest chance and the the way forward gives no chance at all yeah you yeah. know i i think the um what's dangerous with people like no naomi klein and stuff is they have identified this culture as life instead of identifying with life yep. itself. So they think machines and uh, markets and stores and governments are life. And no, these are um, artificial aberrations. They're superfluous to humans, like you've said, Hugh. Yeah, I, I get a and, lot, you know, like, you know, you're against everything. And I'm not against everything. I'm just against the things that you were talking about. It's that they <laughs> think this culture is everything. It's not like, I'm right. for the oceans, I'm for the skies and the, Another fish thing. and the birds and stuff. And it's like, well, you know, 
as far as I'm concerned, I'm for everything. Yep. And they were against everything. But because their world is so narrow and just about industrialized civilization, <clears throat> they, they think I'm negative about everything. Like, no, just industrial civilization. It just happens to be your entire world. But that doesn't mean I'm <laughs> partial. You know? Well, yeah, and, uh, think, of, think okay. about somebody who was addicted to heroin. And you're against that addiction to heroin. And they say, man, you're against everything in the world. It's like, no, I'm against your addiction that's killing you. Sorry, yeah, that's, that's where it comes down is, is, is to life. That, that's why I come down to this. basically it's a life or death situation because the transhumanists are really romancing death. I think that the, the psychology of the, the, even the rapture of the nerds is, is a, it's really a craving for death. They, they are necro, necrophilia. Yep, absolutely agree with you. Um, another thing, I, we don't have to go back, we don't have to dwell on this, but it just, it blows me away what you said earlier about the, that collapse Reddit group, that I would think that a collapse Reddit group would be having the discussion that we're having right now, as opposed to, I mean, it blows me away that you said they're bright green. Again, I have no knowledge. I, I showed up for my thing and I left, and I've never been there before or since. But it it blows me away that a collapse group I, I that that makes cognitive dissonance for me. You would think yeah, a collapse yeah. group would be actually about collapse. And the most the, the furthest that I could grant them would be uh, that they would want some sort of managed collapse. Yeah, they, they want an alternative world. So you have to imagine it as the Gen Z and the the youth, particularly in Extinction Rebellion, and they, they left wing, and they're all about identity politics and climate justice and veganism. So when when they say, you know, they're like saying, what, what are signs of collapse in your neck of the woods? Is they really gloating on the fact that this system doesn't work? And if you if you want to have huge upvotes, you put some disaster porn stuff up there that just says, you know, this this system is finished. And then they're all glorifying it because they depressed and they don't <laughs> they they don't think they have a future and in this, this system. Well, but but it sounds like what you're saying is when this system they're specifically meaning capitalism as we understand, or Western capitalism, however we want to say it, as opposed to the system being the totality of the system. Yeah, they, they, they're not anti-civ in, in a big way. Some of them are anti-civ. There are quite a few um, anarchists and anarcho-primitivists on it. But they're not particularly primitivist. So they, I think if you kind of imagine uh, Ocasio-Cortez's kind of vision, that, that it's all a, a, it's it's kind of a childish vision. It's all we all friends. It's all peaceful. We get rid of all the fascists, and we all you know it's all love and justice and listening. Except fascists, to the except fascists includes everybody who disagrees with this. So it's all love except for anybody who disagrees with this. Well, well the, yes, the, it's it's complete hypocrisy because in what we've discovered talking to these libertarian right guys is. The what I well I kind of knew it before, but the, the all the prejudice and hate is actually on the left. All the guys that are about anti hate and you know the, they are the ones that would would like to. It's it's kind of like you know you you better stop hating or I'll scratch your eyes out. <laughs> it's kind right. of like it's hypocrisy, but it's the the biggest resistance to talking about to the libertarian left and the libertarian left are quite ecological. Um, and so, I mean, the libertarian right is quite, uh, they're quite a lot of uh, ecologists, um, uh, even though they might shoot some of the wild, but they kind of like the idea of the wild and, and kind of Daniel Boone-ish, but, but still, uh, you know, like, like you're saying with a logger, you can you have a bit of meeting of minds with, with a hunter or a fisherman or something like sportsman like that. Uh, they worried that there will be no wilderness left and it'll be taken over by the woke crowd who, who has this kind of childish idea. But they, they're they very open to talking to the left. Uh, the, the libertarian right is very open to talking to the left. They're not prejudiced. But the, the, the left, they virulently hate us. 
So you, unless you just check every box, and you you failed miserably on the trans one, and so do I. But uh, you you have to have this idea that I mean it's 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 patronizing. You have to say that it's toxic masculinity, and you know it's a. The global there's this romanticization of indigenous people, and we can all learn from the global south. And it's poppycock. I come from the global south. <laughs> I got to tell you, the only lesson you can learn from the global south is like leave the global south alone. <laughs> you know, it's just there's only one lesson you can learn from the global south is unplug the global north. But they, it's kind of like we can all have everything. They they spoiled. Um, and and so in where we've got to with the left, it's kind of where you get to with these liberal uh, elites, um, very, very privileged. And all the ideology is an Id ideology of, of, of privilege. And so I say to like this guy on the libertarian right is like, you know, why do you get so upset about wokeism? I don't think it's got much future because we're heading for trouble. I mean, we're heading for financial trouble. We're heading for ecological trouble. There's big social problems <laughs> imminent. And so I say there's nobody's woke in a foxhole. So all of this is going to dry up and disappear with um, as soon as the going gets tough. And I think the going is going to get tough very shortly. So there's a, I want to tell a story from an interview I did back in the 90s. I interviewed this guy, Joel Dyer, who wrote a book called Harvest of Rage. And his book was about how uh, so many, during the farm crisis, which is ongoing, where farmers were losing their land, um, why so many of them were becoming militant right-wingers uh, and, and joining militia groups. And he said that he was, at the time, a hippie, and he had hair down to his butt, and he had an earring, and he rode into a, these small farming towns on his motorcycle, and he would go to the cafe where the farmers would be, you know, at 6 in the morning before they go do their chores. And he said that they might look at him weird for like three seconds, and then as soon as he said, tell me about what's going on in your farm, they didn't care about him being a hippie. They didn't care about him wearing earring. Didn't care about his hair. Um... And what he said is the problem, the reason so many of them were going to the right is because the left was doing a terrible job. And the reason the left was doing a terrible job is he said, so if you got some guy whose family is left and he's losing the land that his family has been on for 100 years, 200 years, 150 years, and he's sitting there with an empty bottle of Jack Daniels and a shotgun in his lap, wondering whether to put it in his mouth. And somebody knocks on the door and says, let's talk about your troubles. He said, if that person is a right-wing militia person, that farmer is going to become right-wing militia. If they're a Mormon, they're going to become a Mormon. If they are a lefty, they would become a lefty. And the problem is that the left was not interested in reaching out to the farmers. And, you know, I heard, and I'm not defending anything he did, I heard some early talks or early things that Timothy McVeigh said about the U.S. military, U.S. imperialism, and, man, they would not have been out of place in a Noam Chomsky talk. He was against imperialism. And I was thinking, as I was watching this documentary about him, man, the left completely blew it. I mean, if, if a lefty would have reached out to Timothy McVeigh at some point, he could have been a really good anti-war veteran who could have spoken. He did speak articulately about, articulately, in an articulate fashion, about uh, the problems with U.S. military being policemen of the world. And that's not who he got in with. And this, so my point on this is just that this is not a new problem at all. This is a, this is a problem with the left for at least 30 years of, of completely ignoring huge sectors. I mean, it, it, this is a bit specific to the United States, but it horrifies me that the left that at one point pretended at least to be about labor now calls blue-collar workers deplorables. 
that horrified me when Hillary Clinton said that. It's like that. Yes, you may disagree with them on many issues, but man, that's I can't imagine 80 years ago or 100 years ago a member of the IWW calling a working class person a deplorable. Well, look at Michael Moore. And I, I was I was <coughs> horrified during the insurrection because he, I mean, I, across the board, as far as I could see it, the the radical left, what was supposed to be the radical left, were making all these statements. How dare they come into our Congress and our seat of government and trash it and say like, you know, your left wing in, in the 60s, that was the left wing dream was to trumble through Congress. And now they finally getting all these people riled up and stamping on Congress. These guys have come full circle. They're conservatives, you know, wringing their hands about the democratic institutions being, <laughs> being undermined. It's, it's, it's come full circle. And Michael Moore famously said, I believe in the 90s, that uh, um, the Michigan militia was the unemployed arm of the UAW. Um, so I'm going to have to go in a few minutes. Do you want to ask me a wind down question? Well, okay, so we better, well, since we got to this point, then maybe we can just end on this one thing and we late in the video, so it's a good place to do it because of the bots and you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, uh, I think one of the deficits on the left, if you're talking about these shortcomings, is you know going full spectrum because another one of these blind spots is the days of the militant left are kind of gone and there's this pacifism, extreme pacifism, and they will not do full spectrum. But on the right, they have no problem with that. And so in terms of where I think you and I agree on is that we, you know, it's time for radical action. And so, you know, the, the right is ready for that. They, they're itching for it. And the left has gone all weak at the knees and so is, is extremely Gundy and MLK and taking all the wrong lessons for, for the crisis that we face. So is that is that actually is that accurate? Because I'm thinking about uh, uh, BLM and Antifa riots in the United States, and um, unfortunately, I they were based a lot on identity politics. Yeah, the identity politics. You see, they so I mean, if you if you look at Antifa. They'll punch out a Nazi, but the you you don't see black blocks and things anymore. Um, I think okay. I'm not a huge fan of Antifa, um, in part because they threatened to kill me and everybody I know, and um, over the trans issue primarily, and also because I disagree with some other things that they do. And it's 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 really I don't mind saying this. It's really a cult. In that anybody who yeah, doesn't know anything about them yeah, is, uh, and it, it's, it's okay. I've had some really interesting con conversations with Chris Hedges, and I really like Chris Hedges a lot. And he and I disagree some on pacifism, um, in part because he's been a war correspondent. It's very interesting. He's been a war correspondent, and his lesson from violence is that it destroys people and he has seen a lot of his friends die and he basically has combat fatigue and i respect it i respect his positions i respect him it's all great and he and i have interesting conversations and he respects me too and my experience of violence was my violent childhood and what i took from my violent childhood is that abusers are insatiable and that this culture expanded to the large scale this culture will not stop of its own and we need to stop it that it will continue to come up with excuses to destroy the planet and so and i don't think he disagrees with that either and a, a place that he and i completely agree with on this is that a lot of people who perpetrate violence or who are willing to perpetrate violence often do so 
for the wrong reasons because it's often, and I'm thinking of you, Antifa, it's often because they have some emotional issues they need to work out as opposed to, which is why you can rationalize or they can rationalize burning a mom and pop store as opposed to, or just random burning, as opposed to, as you were saying earlier, attacking the halls of power. You know, I have no problem with militant resistance as long as it's tactical, strategic, and moral. And I do have large problems with militant resistance that is not tactical, strategic, and moral. So I've, I've seen, like, you, you, so, so I wish, here's what I really wish about violence. I wish that we could have, and maybe we should do this sometime, I wish we could have serious, principled, open, honest, which includes talking about our concerns too, conversations about when it is or is not appropriate to act to, to have militant acts of resistance. Yeah, I, I think that would be so good to do. So just from my point of view, I come from exactly both Chris Hedges and your world. I was an abused child, and then I got to see all the violence in South Africa. Uh, so what's my conclusion is exactly the same as you, is these guys are psychopathic and they're implacable. And then... I, my experience in South Africa also shows me just exactly how how it is required. It, it's basically that this this doesn't end nicely. So it's it's if you nobody nobody craves violence. I, I agree with you in the Antifa thing. It's there is some some minor case for having some you know therapy for you know it's kind of aggression therapy to to kind of get it out of your system and it is good to do that but you can do that on in a much smaller scale with monkey wrenching and stuff like that just just small scale sabotage you don't have to really go full on um crazy about it but i i agree that it's there's a a certain point you get to where you have to say we understand the landscape and the, the requirements of of the landscape are exactly where the anc got to the anc split uh, because they got to this point, they said we, we've we, we've done. They, the ANC started in about 1901, and by our Sharpeville, 60 years. They they said like we've been at this 60 years, and we know what it's going to take to budget. And they were right to make it budge, right? And th they were absolutely right. It took the the ma the magic kryptonite, and the, <laughs> and the kryptonite is very very powerful stuff. And so there's there's no ways that we, this situation is going to resolve itself in time, given the pace of the ecological destruction. So I, I think we, we should have that conversation because I don't see anybody having it. And and I'm sure we can have it in such a way that it's, um, you know, aspirational, not operational, so that basically you wouldn't get us into too much trouble having it. But I, I really would like to do that one next if we could. Okay, that sounds great. Well, thank you so much again for being, <laughs> being yeah, on. Thank you very really, much, Derek. Very yeah. nice to talk to you. Yeah, appreciate your uh, being here. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for your your great questions and the great conversation. And and thank you for your book and all your work in the world. Thanks. You too. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Take, Take care. care. Bye. 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 Bye.